Pronto, está gravando agora, a partir desse momento, segunda parte da nossa aula, nossa aula de hoje, dia 29, né? 29 de outubro de 2021. Olha, esse documentário, não tem do YouTube, esse aqui está na íntegra. É onde eu saiba, né? porque eu não conheço uma versão mais longa que essa. Estão os dois juntos. Eu vou colocar aqui no chat o link. E também tem o outro, que também duas partes, que são inimigos da razão. Tem o... Esse que é o... o... O vírus, Deus um delírio, o vírus da fé. A parte de Deus ainda está na parte Deus um delírio. E o vírus da fé é que ele fala da educação religiosa. Né? Esse documentário, na realidade, está é, baseado no livro, o, que em português é o, o, o vírus da fé. É um livro dele. Certo. E, e o outro, os inimigos da razão, não, não, é, não é baseado em nenhum específico, nenhum livro específico dele. Os inimigos da razão são as pseudociências, né? Ele fala das pseudociências. Olha, são documentários produzidos para o grande público. Quando, em 1970, não sei qual foi o ano, mas em 77, ele lançou o livro O Gênio Egoísta. Logo depois disso, criaram, fizeram um documentário baseado na, no livro. E ele foi descoberto, digamos assim, como apresentador. Certo? Ele, se, é, ele tem um monte de livros de divulgação. Depois eu falo em todos eles, assim, com os livros de divulgação. Por enquanto, estou mostrando só esses documentários. São documentários para o grande público. A argumentação dele a favor do ateísmo é a que, a, aquela que vocês já conhecem. E é lógico que é muito mais baseada no, no sistema de crenças. Olha, por exemplo, ele diz no livro O Vírus da Fé, certo? que no começo ali é muito mais uma defesa do livre pensamento, da liberdade de escolha e na liberdade de crença, também é uma defesa da liberdade de crença, inclusive de se aceitar a ciência, etc. Ele, ele diz que, do mesmo jeito que a pessoa tem o direito... De ter, de ter fé cristã, etc., ele pode ter o direito de ser ateu. Também ele defende esse direito de ser ateu e ser aceito por isso. Porque é complicado o ateísmo. Nos Estados Unidos, por exemplo, se a pessoa se declara como ateu, nos Estados Unidos, ele não consegue ser eleito, por exemplo. Então, ele dá esse, esse exemplo de que, que a pessoa tem, tem o direito de serem de ser ateísmo. E a argumentação dele também é a questão... Ele diz assim, quando me perguntam por que, que eu sou ateu, etc., ou por que você acredita que Deus não exista, aí ele diz que... Ele responde né, que apenas não vê nenhuma evidência de que Deus é necessário, de que Deus seja uma explicação necessária para o funcionamento do universo. Que é algo muito parecido com, com outros, como José Sanamago, que era ateu e argumentava dessa forma. Ele simplesmente não existe nenhuma evidência dele, ele não parece ser necessário, 
E o ônus da prova é de quem afirma a existência e não de quem afirma a inexistência de algo. É, como se prova a inexistência? A gente tem que provar a existência. Certo? E isso, como me diz, a vida parece ter surgido mesmo ao acaso e a evolução também é um fruto de, das leis e forças da natureza, do mesmo jeito que o universo. Até agora, não há nenhuma evidência da existência de um criador ou coisa assim. E, por isso mesmo, ele prefere acreditar que não exista. E ele nem, há, nem é agnóstico mesmo. E... Ele até argumenta assim, no livro o, o, o Deus, um delírio. Ele, no livro Deus, um delírio, é falando do Raiga, ter vindo com o Bush. Isso é lógico que... Olha, religiões institucionalizadas, todas elas têm articulações políticas. Eu falo também... Você sabe ao longo da história o que foi a Igreja Católica? Inquisição, etc., do poder político. Todas elas têm envolvido, estão envolvidas em questões grandes... Porque são grandes instituições. Se vocês me dizem assim, citando o exemplo lá do Evangelho, que meu rei, de Jesus tem dito, meu reino não é deste mundo, mas uma instituição como a Igreja Católica ou essas igrejas ou uma irmandade islâmica, uma igreja fundamentalista evangélica dessas, são instituições físicas, concretas, com gente, com dinheiro, etc. Então, são reinos deste mundo mesmo. Tem jeito, aquele é reino deste mundo. O reino do Papa é um reino deste mundo. Né? Ah, tanto é que ali no Evangelho não tem momento nenhum de se ter indicação de uma de criação de uma instituição social, social política, com organização. Foi uma, foi uma criação do, do, dos romanos, né, depois. Quando se tornou religião é, oficial. Mas, falando na argumentação dele, tem um momento que ele se pergunta que o grande problema do ser humano é o medo da morte. Certo? Porque é um consolo ao medo da morte acreditar na imortalidade da alma ou do espírito, do, do que quer que seja. E Richard Dawkins, usando uma argumentação puramente, dentro do ponto de vista puramente científico, diz assim, olha, vocês... Você parem para pensar, você, o leitor, pare aqui para pensar o seguinte, do ponto de vista estritamente científico, era você, eu, a sua existência é um acaso muito grande, porque a potencialidade de existir são muito grandes. É aquele argumento, você imagina que você é fruto da união do espermatozoide do seu pai com o óvulo da sua mãe. Se fosse um outro espermatozoide, você não existiria. E em cada ejaculação são milhões de espermatozoides. E, isso, e você aplica isso a todos os seus antepassados. Então, era muito mais provável você não existir do que existir. Então, ele diz, praticamente diz o seguinte. Então, você deve dar graças. Não vou falar graças a Deus, não. Você deve dar... É, você deve dar ser feliz pela oportunidade da existência porque era muito mais provável você nunca nem ter existido para poder morrer um dia nunca nem ter vivido para poder morrer era simplesmente não existir eu vou continuar agora o documentário viu eu vou continuar, é o nosso tempo, é bom começar agora para pelo menos terminar esse, certo? Vou aqui, está gravando. Certo. Vou o. Cadê ele? 
que falta... Está em 30 minutos, né? falta uma hora e pouquinho, é o tempo. Eu paro para ver te fazer retorno, para ver te fazer um comentário, certo? Parar aqui para mim fazer um comentário, certo? Agora, depois eu falo para vocês de cientista como Francis Collins, que é evangélico, biólogo Francis Collins, ele era gen é geneticista. O Robert Sheldrake, que é um bioquímico, o, o Collins é americano, e o Sheldrake é britânico, como Richard Dawkins. Depois eu falo sobre eles. Eu ficou faltando um negócio aqui de. Mas depois. Vou continuar agora. Vou apresentar uma guia. Esse aqui, vírus da fé. Com... Aqui. A mirror image of Islamic extremism, an American Taliban. We live in a time of lethal polarization, when the great religions are pushing their conflict to a point where it is difficult to see how they can ever be reconciled. In New York, Madrid and London, we've witnessed the religious insanities of the Middle East penetrate the heart of the secular West. To understand the likes of Osama bin Laden, you have to realize that the religious terrorism they inspire is the logical outcome of deeply held faith. Even so-called moderate believers are part of the same religious fabric. They encourage unreason as a positive virtue. What's really scary is that religious warriors think of what they are doing as the ultimate good. Those of us brought up in Christianity can soon get the message. Onward, Christian soldiers, fight the good fight. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. But as far as I'm concerned, the war between good and evil is really just the war between two evils. This is the Holy Land, where the terrible certainties of faith began and still rage. I've come here because it's a microcosm of the religious conflicts which threaten rational values and civilization. The dreadful combination of politics and extreme faith has caused the death of almost 4,000 people here in shootings, suicide bombings and reprisals in the last five years. Despite the troubles, tourists still flock to Jerusalem, to places that their particular brand of religion taught them to revere as a child. The Via Dolorosa, where Jesus was allegedly whipped and beaten during the last hours of his life. Or the Muslim Dome of the Rock. Or the Western Wall, Judaism's and the world's most holy ruin. On the surface, it looks like a place of harmless myth. Because here is the hill of Calvary, where Jesus was crucified in the tomb of Jesus. Here, what we are facing, to the stone of anointment, where the body of Jesus was taken down from the cross. So this is the slab where Christ's body was anointed with oil. How do we know that? Is there any evidence that it was here? 
You see, this is by telling from person to person. It's, tra it's tradition. Tradition yes. from generation to the next. Yeah. We can see the hole where the cross was stood. Where they putting the cross inside the hole, and this is the place where the place of the crucifixion and where Jesus died on the cross. You, you don't really believe that, do you? Uh, this is the Christians, I explained to you that they believe this is the place where the crucifixion took place. And if we come closer to here, to my side, please, thank you. Uh, the of the tomb is a Greek priest, the tomb regarding the tomb of Jesus. This is left from the big part of the stone which closed the tomb. What we call it the rolling of angels. Watch your head, please, thank you very much. Yes. This is where you slayed and rose from. But we call it sepulcher, means empty tomb. God bless you. You can touch in the tomb. You can make your prayer. Please, uh, I get four days off. You come tomorrow, I leave it, no further. Forget. This holy city has to be one of the least enlightened places in the world. And it is also a place of barely suppressed religious hatreds. There will come the day, and that day is now, when you're on our lands, spreading these ideas that the soldiers of Allah will not put up with this. We live at a time when religious belief is fighting back against reason and scientific truth. This is a problem for all of us, because religion's irrational roots nourish intolerance to the point of murder. I'm in Jerusalem's old city, trying to understand the role deeply held faith plays in the bitter conflict here. One of the first things you notice is the edgy watchfulness. The different ethnic and religious communities live cheek by jowl, but there are security checkpoints throughout the old city and one section, above all, is under heavy guard. For the Muslims, the compound enclosing the Dome of the Rock and El Aqsa Mosque is, after Mecca and Medina, the third holiest site in Islam. It was from here, they believe, that the Prophet Muhammad flew up to heaven. As bad luck would have it, the Jews believe the same place is the site of the long-destroyed first and second temples, the holiest shrine in Judaism. Jews are not allowed to worship inside the compound. Their prayers are restricted to the ruined western or wailing wall. When Jesus came here to overturn the tables, there was no mosque in view. When the Arabs conquered this part of the world, they established the El Aqsa Mosque, and then they put over where we think is the main temple compound, where the altar was, where the Holy of Holies was, they put another building called the Dome of the Rock, which is not properly a mosque, and um, we, at the present moment, are simply not allowed in there, inside the compound, identifiably as Jews. The Muslims reject these Jewish claims. And when Ariel Sharon entered the Temple Mount area in the year 2000... I came here with a message of peace. His visit sparked the second, or Al-Aqsa, Intifada a Palestinian uprising that has cost 4,000 lives so far. And if the Jews sincerely want peace with the Arabs and the Muslims, then they should stand away, keep away from the Al-Aqsa Mosque. In the Muslim religion, there is no possibility anyway of sharing the territory if I come in there in some far corner far away from a mosque in an open area under a tree somewhere if a Muslim will catch me murmuring Psalms or some other prayer he will call the police to have me um, egressed shall I say as far as the Al-Aqsa mosque is considered 
there are no negotiations, absolutely no negotiation about it. لأنه لا يملك أحد من المسلمين في العالم أن يتفاوض على الأقصى. Because no Muslim has the right worldwide to uh, negotiate over the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Again and again, my conversations come back to the solid walls that religion puts up, back to implacable faiths. My holy book is true. I am right. He is wrong. So I went to meet someone who, in my naivety, I thought might be able to see both sides of the story. Yusuf Al-Khattab used to be called Joseph Cohen, born and brought up as a secular Jew in New York. In 1998, he moved to Gaza as a Jewish settler. But there he discovered a different God, Allah. <laughs> What I noticed coming to this center of world religions, what a lot of hatred religion fosters. I mean, I'm an atheist, and I, I'm rather gentle. I don't, I don't hate people, but it seems to me that I'm hearing hate on all sides, mm -hmm. and it seems to me all to do with religion. I hate atheists because atheists don't care if somebody fornicates in the middle of the street. They don't care if they're women go bouncing around on TV topless, it makes no difference to them. They don't believe in anything. If you don't believe in a set rule, and you believe that a constitution can change, and you can amend the rules as they go along, and you don't believe in God's rule, then what law do you have? You just have man-made laws. I realized I was in the company of someone who has willingly bought into fundamentalist dogma. What do you think about the um, September the 11th attacks on New York and the um, July the 7th attacks but, on London. Okay, since you like to speak about evolution, I like to start before. What do you think about the Jews that have destroyed over 417 Arab villages, including all mosques and masjids, which wouldn't affect you because you're an atheist? So what are you saying, that we should sit back and say, oh, you know what, let us progress and let us sit down and drink tea and talk about what to do? I think that's the most ridiculous thing. All I could say is, if there was no quote-unquote state of Israel, there would have been no September 11th. But if we've all got to live together, it's not going to be helped if there are people of very, very strong faith who simply know they're right and are not amenable to argument. Because there's somebody out there who's just as faithful as you and has his faith just as strong as yours, which is opposite to yours. You see, the problem is, Richard, I think that you have fear. You know that this party of occupying Muslim lands and polluting society with these evil ideas that are around, it's not going to last forever. There will always be the soldiers of Allah there to give the, the response to this. So we also want the same thing. All we want is that we want the non-Muslims at this point off the lands of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All the lands of Muhammad, we want the kuffar out of it. Do you want Islam to take over the rest of the world? Of course I want it to, and it will. So my advice is to clean up your show at home, take your forces off our lands, correct yourselves, fix your society, all right? Fix your women. Uh, fix your women. That's not my business. That's my women's business. No, it's, not no it is women. your business. It is your business. When you take the women and dress them like whores on the street. I don't dress women. They dress themselves. Do, no, but you allow it as a norm to let the women go on the street dressed like this. What's going on with your society? But I'm interested in religion and the effect that it has on people's minds. And I'm worried about And we're people. very worried about you. What's going on with the stealing, with the theft, out of control? Clearly, historic injustice towards the Palestinians breeds hatred and anger. But we must face up to the fact that in creating the death cults of suicide bombers, it's unshakable, unreasonable conviction in your own righteous faith that is the key. If preachers then tell the faithful that paradise after martyrdom is better than existence here in the real world, it's hardly surprising that some crazed followers will actually swallow it leading to a terrible cycle of vendetta, war, and suffering. Well, I'm here on the Mount of Olives, looking out over this beautiful old city. 
we've heard some pretty extreme statements, some hatred, some bigotry, such as I haven't really heard before. I don't see what future the world has as long as people think like that, and people are going to go on thinking like that, as long as they're brought up from childhood, from the cradle, to think that there's something good about faith, to think that there's something good about believing because you've been told to believe rather than believing because you've looked at the evidence. I want to say that killing for God is not only hideous murder, it is also utterly ridiculous. Unlike religion, science doesn't pretend to know everything. There are still deep questions about the origins of the universe that have yet to be explained. But just because science can't answer them right now doesn't mean faith, tradition, revelation, or an ancient holy text can. Science can't disprove the existence of God, but that does not mean that God exists. There are a million things we can't disprove. The philosopher Bertrand Russell had an analogy. Imagine there's a china teapot in orbit around the sun. You cannot disprove the existence of the teapot because it's too small to be spotted by our telescopes. Nobody but a lunatic would say, well, I'm prepared to believe in the teapot because I can't disprove it. Maybe we have to be technically and strictly agnostic, but in practice we are all teapot atheists. But now, suppose that everybody in the society, the teachers, the tribal elders, all had faith in the teapot. Stories of the teapot have been handed down for generations. It's part of the tradition of the society. There are holy books about the teapot. Then somebody who said they did not believe in the teapot might be regarded as eccentric or even mad. There's an infinite number of things like celestial teapots that we can't disprove. There are fairies. There are unicorns. Hobgoblins. We can't disprove any of those. But we don't believe in them any more than nowadays we believe in Thor, Amun-Ra, or Aphrodite. We are all atheists about most of the gods that societies have ever believed in. Some of us just go one god further. How do we explain the mysteries of life? Science has steadily overturned old religious myths about how all this came to be. Yet those who adhere to Judaism, Christianity or Islam still prefer to ignore reason and have faith in their forever unprovable omniscient creator. The devil have called that person from under the blood. For example, when I became a Christian, I had a hard time obeying my parents. Seems I had thought science was rolling back religious belief, but I was wrong. Far from being beaten, militant faith is on the march all across the world with terrifying consequences. As a scientist, I'm increasingly worried about how faith is undermining science. It's something we must resist because irrational faith is feeding murderous intolerance throughout the world. In this program, I want to examine two further problems with religion. I believe it can lead to a warped and inflexible morality, and I'm very concerned about the religious indoctrination of children. I want to show how faith acts like a virus that attacks the young and infects generation after generation. I believe in a, a, a lawgiver, a god right, right there, actually not behind it, right imminent here, right now. 
I want to ask whether ancient mythology should be taught as truth in schools. Professor Dawkins, I am very impressed that you are the new messiah and I appreciate your, your, your desire to redeem the world. It's time to question the abuse of childhood innocence with superstitious ideas of hellfire and damnation. I would rather for them to understand that hell is a place that they absolutely do not want to go. This one would have been a preacher. Now they'll never hear his voice. And I want to show how the scriptural roots of the Judeo-Christian moral edifice are cruel and brutish. Thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth, but thou shalt utterly destroy them. What in the 21st century are we doing venerating a book that contains such stuff? Science weighs up evidence and advances. Religion is hidebound belief for belief's sake. It's bad for our children, and it's bad for you. There is something exceedingly odd about the idea of sectarian religious schools. If we hadn't got used to it over the centuries, we'd find it downright bizarre. Sectarian education has proved to be deeply damaging. It has left a terrible legacy. When you think about it, isn't it weird the way we automatically label a tiny child with its parents' religion? These are Jewish children. In another part of Jerusalem, we've seen Muslim children. In Northern Ireland, we have Catholic children, Protestant children, all going to separate schools. But what's so special about religion that it is allowed to label small children Catholic or Protestant, Jewish or Muslim? Nobody would categorize children by the political party their parents support, call them Tory or Labour children. We agree they're too young to know where they stand on questions of politics. So why is it not the same for where they stand on the cosmos and humanity's place in it? In genetic evolution, a species divides into two, initially geographically. There's some initial separation between the two subspecies, and they divide away from each other genetically. There's no longer gene flow between them, and so they can become separate species. It's a divisive force. Sectarian education acts in a similar way. Children are initially isolated from each other because of their parents' faith. Then their differences are constantly drilled into them, and they embark on opposing life trajectories. Such divisions are encouraged, not just in faraway Israel, but right on our doorstep, in Northern Ireland, for instance, or in London. In North London, the Hasidic Jewish community is the largest after Israel and New York. Here, religious division is taken to its extreme. These ultra-Orthodox Jews only marry within their sect. Television is frowned upon, and of course children attend exclusive religious schools, cloistered away from external influences, which just might persuade them to look outside their community. I want to find out why these children are being segregated and whether their culture allows them to open their minds to reality. Hello. Hello. Rabbi Glock. Nice to meet you. I'm Richard Dawkins. Dawkins. How do you do? Thanks, but fine. Nice to meet you. Please come in. Good. Thank you very much. Rabbi Glock is London born and bred, but he wouldn't necessarily know it. His accent is a testament to the isolation of this religious sect. Why should children be victims of the particular tradition in which they happen to have been born rather than choosing for themselves by being shown all the evidence that's available? We are all, to a certain extent, uh, affected by our surroundings. Um, there's no such thing as a person living in a vacuum. Indeed. We're all affected by our parents, by our family. Yes. But at the same time, we have a choice to stay or otherwise. 
I think it's important for a minority to be able to have a space where it can express itself, where it can learn about itself. Well, couldn't you preserve the, the customs, the traditions, the history without somehow imposing upon the children views about the universe which modern science would say are simply false? I would say impose upon a Jew anything. Uh, I would say that's uh, something which is impossible. I think scientifically impossible. We believe that God created the world in six days. We know about evolution. Every single Jewish kid knows about evolution and, and has thought about it and has studied it and has looked at it and has thought, what's going on here? How many of the children who come up through your system, your school system, end up believing in evolution? I, I think that the, the, the majority don't believe in evolution. They, but at the same time, it isn't they don't believe because they don't know about it. You realize they're being taught that the entire world began after what archaeologists would recognize as the agricultural revolution. Um, I mean, these children are being brought up in a very distorted world indeed. I worry about children being victims of this kind of what I can only describe as miseducation. I find uh, the terms as distorted and miseducation rather disturbing. Judaism has its tradition. I think uh, there are various uh, scientists who have their tradition. It's still called the theory of evolution. Well, it's called that, but that's in it's a very technical called, sense. Yeah, but, still, but still, it's called that. And it's not called the law of evolution. Well, I will call it the fact of evolution. Uh, and you're, you're, you're a fundamentalist believer. No, I'm not a fundamentalist believer. The age of the Earth, 5,000 years. I mean, that is, I'm sorry, Rabbi, that is ridiculous. Of course, Rabbi Gluck is right that it's important for us to learn about our own background. But what upsets me is that in pursuit of that, these innocent children are being saddled with demonstrable falsehoods. And this is not just a problem of the Jewish minority. There's pressure from an increasing number of faith schools of other religions to put scientific fact on a par with primitive creation myths. In science classes, why can't they simply teach science? You say, this is truth because it's based on evidence. That's well, such a no, funny you don't answer. exactly say that. You say, we're struggling towards the truth, and as new evidence comes in, we refine it. And in the and middle of that, better. Jesus says, I am truth. <laughs> We live in the shadow of a religiously inspired terror in an era when science has plainly shown religious superstitions to be false. The Lord's my shepherd, not and yet it's a strange anomaly that faith schools are increasing in number and influence in our education system with active encouragement from Tony Blair's government. There are already 7,000 faith schools in Britain but the government's trust reforms are encouraging many more. Over half the new city academies are expected to be sponsored by religious organizations. The most worrying development is a new wave of private evangelical schools that have adopted the American Baptist ACE curriculum, Accelerated Christian Education. Have you been to one of these schools? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Okay. Accelerated Christian Education slips religious superstitions back into science. If you want to be rude, you would say it's program learning. If you want to be polite, it's individualized instruction. Okay. So really, each one is teaching themselves to a certain extent, of course, that has to be modified with adult supervision and so on. All right, so here, you need to find the page where the answer is. I like the page number next to it. When you find the answer, you need to underline it, OK? I had a look at the curriculum booklet that mm -hmm. they use for science, and it was very noticeable that 
God or Jesus did come on just about every page. Yes, yes. Um, we don't have anything like religious instruction in the school because it is part of... I can of see he wouldn't need it. No, yes. of course not. Um, Absolutely. In, the, in um, one section in the science thing, I suddenly, I was sort of taken aback because I suddenly started reading about Noah's Ark. And what's that got to do with a science lesson? I suppose that depends on your opinion. <laughs> it could have a lot. <laughs> If you believe in the story, it could, it could have a lot to do with science. But I mean, the stuff that I was taught when I was a kid at school in science, now you would laugh at and say it was a myth, but that's what I was taught. Well, what, what, were you ta what were you taught? Well, when I was taught, one of the things that they taught me at school that I've always remembered was that the moon came from the ocean here on Earth and yes. was flung into space, yeah. and that's where it came from. Yes. You know, what you should so have been taught, I suppose, is that there is a, a strong current theory that that's what happened. So, so what you're really trying to ask me is, do you think the Genesis story was true and that God created the world in seven days? That's what you would really like to ask me, right? My answer to that is, I don't know. Having said that, do I think that if God wanted to do it in seven days, he could? Yeah, I think he could. You could do anything. Yeah. Yes. So, so it, it's, a, it's a, a sort of an academic question which, actually, I don't care about the answer very much, really. Yes. Does that make sense? Kind of, yes, it does make sense. No. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me because I do care about the answer. Why? Um, because I care about what's true and, and I... I care uh, about what's true. Yes. Well, I, I, I find <laughs> Christianity encompasses everything about life. Christianity is life, so it, it's, it, it's about everything. It touches well, education, politics, yeah. care, social services, everything, you see. Let me ask about another thing in the booklet, which was about AIDS and uh, HIV. I think somewhere it talks about AIDS being wages of sin. Um, mm. Is that mixing health education with <laughs> moralistic well, preaching? I suppose the flip side of that is that if there is no God and there is no lawgiver, why does it matter what I do? Why, why, why is rape wrong? Why well, is paedophilia wrong? Why, why are any of these things wrong if there is no lawgiver? You've just said a very revealing thing. But if are no... you telling me that the only reason why you don't steal and rape and, and murder is that you're frightened of God. I think that all people, if they think they can get away with something and it is there is no consequences, we actually tend to do that. I think that is the reality. Look at the world in which we live. That is the reality. OK, well, I think we better leave it at that. <laughs> Adrian Hawkes, I'm sure, is a well-meaning man. But why should he impose his personal version of reality on children? Not only are they encouraged to consider the weird claims of the Bible alongside scientific fact, they're also being indoctrinated into what an objective observer might see as a warped morality. It's pretty wild on there, isn't it? Let me explain why, when it comes to children, I think of religion as a dangerous virus. It's a virus which is transmitted partly through teachers and clergy, but also down the generations from parent to child to grandchild. Children are especially vulnerable to infection by the virus of religion. A child is genetically pre-programmed to accumulate knowledge from figures of authority. Stand on the rope. That's it. Now. Hold on here. Here, here. There. And here. Hold tight. Got it? Good. There you go. The child brain, for very good Darwinian reasons, has to be set up in such a way that it believes what it's told by its elders. Because there just isn't time for the child to experiment with warnings like, don't go too near the cliff edge, or don't swim in the river, there are crocodiles. Any child who applied a scientific, skeptical, questioning attitude to that would be dead. No wonder the Jesuit said, give me the child for his first seven years, and I'll give you the man. The child brain will automatically believe what it's told, even if what it's told is nonsense. And then when the child grows up, it will tend to pass on that same nonsense to its children. Well, so many people think they've got the truth, but they only got deceit. And the devil's greatest weapon was deception. And so religion goes on from generation to generation. What are you going to be known as when you die? Sinner or winner? Come on, Shiro. To be winners and not to be sinners. For many people, part of growing up is killing off the virus of faith 
with a good strong dose of rational thinking. But if an individual doesn't succeed in shaking it off, his mind is stuck in a permanent state of infancy, and there is a real danger that he will infect the next generation. I'm going to meet someone who has experienced religion as child abuse firsthand. Jill Mitten. Oh, hello. hello. I'm Richard Dawkins. Hello, Richard. How do you do? Jill Mitten was brought up in a strict Christian sect. Yeah. Today, she's a psychologist who rehabilitates young adults similarly scarred by their narrow religious upbringing. They need to be allowed to hear different perspectives on things. They need to be allowed to investigate. They need to be allowed to develop their critical faculties so that they can take a number of different viewpoints and, and weigh them up and decide which one is for them. They need to find their own pathways, not, not to be forced into a particular mold as a child. If I think back to my childhood, it's one that's kind of dominated by fear. Um, and it was a fear of disapproval while in the present, but also of eternal damnation. Do they get taught about hellfire and things like Absolutely. that? Absolutely. And to a child, images of hellfire and gnashing of teeth are actually very real. They're not metaphorical at all. Of course not. No. If you bring a child up and discourage it from thinking freely and making choices freely, then that's, that's, that's still, to me, that is, a, that is a form of mental abuse or psychological abuse. Or if you tell a child that when it dies, it's going to roast forever in, in hell. In hell, that is abusive, yes. What do they tell you about it? I mean, what, what, what happens in hell? It's strange, isn't it? After all this time, it still has the power to affect me when, when, you, when you ask me that question. Hell is a fearful place. It's complete rejection by God. It's complete judgment. There is real fire. There is real torment, real torture. And it goes on forever. So there is no respite from it. It's deeply disturbing to think that there are believers out there who actively use the idea of hell for moral policing. In the United States, Christian obsession with sin has spawned a national craze for hell houses. Morality plays come Halloween freak shows in which the evangelical hobby horses of abortion and homosexuality are literally demonized. Come on in. <laughs> Chrissy, be still. This was your choice. Good, no, Good job, guys. It's not quite Pastor Keenan Roberts is rehearsing a new production of his Colorado-based Hell House, which he's written and staged for almost 15 years. He fervently believes that you have to scare people into being good. The call upon my life as a pastor, as a minister, is to tell people what the book says. And what I and we and our church and hundreds of churches across this country and around the world are doing is we have found a very creative, effective tool that is getting people's attention to I believe consider it. the message. I believe it. We want to leave an indelible impression upon their life that sin destroys. Every scene preaches the truth that either sin destroys or Jesus saves. You weren't gonna hurt me! You hurt me! Chrissy, it's only a medical procedure. No! No, I changed my mind! It's just too bad! I wasn't there the night you were born. <laughs> Good. If this is a rehearsal, think how horrific the full production must be. I presume you have a, a cut-off age for the, for the tour. I mean, no, no children below an age of 
So what, what is your cutoff age? Well, over the years of having audiences and people go through this, we have uh, come to uh, the decision that the best age for uh, young people is really at 12. Yeah. You see, killing babies is such a wonderful <laughs> choice. It's so convenient. Would it worry you if a child of 12 coming to see your performance had nightmares afterwards? Or would you, would you like that? I would like them, I would like for their life to be changed no matter what. I would rather for them to understand that hell is a place that they absolutely do not want to go. I would rather reach them with that message at 12 than to not reach them with that message and have them live a life of sin and to never find the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you solemnly swear to never believe that you are normal and that God is responsible for making you this way? In the case of homosexual marriage, what harm does that do? Why would you be so passionately against that? They're living in sin. That's your opinion, but it's nothing to do with you, is it? It's, it's their decision. Opinion. It's not my opinion. I'm telling you what the Bible says. It's the Bible's opinion, but these are two people who want to live together. Isn't it their own business? What, what right have you to interfere? This woman and this woman, burning in a repulsive lust for one another, deceived by all of them that they've been born gay are joining their deeply confused lives in this nauseating matrimony. <laughs> First Corinthians 6, oh. God says. First Corinthians 6, God says. Will you cue him? Homosexuality you equals sin. And sin equals I want them to know homosexuality is sin. But you believe it presumably on the basis of scriptural authority. You believe Absolutely. It yeah. Um, unapologetically. But, yes, unapologetically. But why are you so sure that's right? I mean, if you think about where the scriptures come from, I mean, who wrote them and when? And what, what makes you so confident they're right? It's what I believe. I know you're right. It, 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 it is a faith issue with me. Why do you not believe it? Uh, because of evidence. Hell House is the brash end of a much bigger problem with the way religious belief works. Taken to its extremes, as by American evangelists, the Bible is scanned for passages to justify right-wing views on abortion and family values. I'm about to meet a believer who uses the Word of God to fight against centuries of human progress. I think execution for adultery is not uh, rejected. Not rejected by whom? By you? No, by, by the New Testament writers. What about you? Do, you? do you favor execution of adultery? I think that's fair to say that that's still a, uh, a proper uh, punishment uh, that the state ought to prosecute. It's not so bad, surely, to believe in moral codes handed down to us from the good book. Doesn't the Bible give us a moral framework in which to live? Well, no. The holy texts are of dubious origin and veracity, and they're internally contradictory. And when we look closely, we find a system of morals which any civilized person today should surely find poisonous. The Old Testament is in every church and synagogue throughout the world, and is the root of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. If your brother, the son of your father or of your mother, or your son or daughter, or the spouse whom you embrace, tries to secretly seduce you, saying, let us go and serve other gods. This is God's advice on what to do to a friend or family member who suggests you believe in another deity. You must kill him. Your hand must strike the first blow in putting him to death. You must stone him to death, since he has tried to divert you from Yahweh, your God. The God of the Old Testament has got to be the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, petty, vindictive, unjust, unforgiving, racist, an ethnic cleanser urging his people on to acts of genocide. If God doesn't set a good moral example, who does? Abraham? 
the founding father of all three great monotheistic religions, the man who would willingly make a burnt offering of his son Isaac? Maybe not. How about Moses, he of the tablets which said, Thou shalt not kill? Well, the same man, it says in the book of Numbers, was incensed by the Israelites' merciful restraint towards the conquered Midianite people. He gave orders to kill all male prisoners and older women. But all the women children that have not known a man by lying with him, keep, keep alive, alive for, for yourselves. yourselves. How is this story of Moses morally distinguishable from Hitler's rape of Poland or Saddam Hussein's massacre of the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. So let's leave Moses out of it. But there are lesser characters facing somewhat more everyday moral dilemmas. Maybe they provide a better role model. In the book of Judges, a priest was traveling with his wife in Gibeah. They spent the night in the house of an old man. But during supper, a mob came to demand that the host hand over his male guest. So that we may know him. Yes, in the biblical sense. Well, the old man replied, Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man, do not so vile. So, enjoy yourselves by raping and humiliating my daughter, but show a proper respect for my guest, who is, after all, male. Whatever else this strange story might mean, it surely tells us something about the status of women in this religious society. Now, of course, nice Christians will be protesting. Everyone knows the Old Testament is deeply unpleasant. The New Testament of Jesus, they claim, undoes the damage and makes it all right. Yes, there's no doubt that from a moral point of view, Jesus is a huge improvement, because Jesus, or whoever wrote his lines, was not content to derive his ethics from the scriptures with which he'd been brought up. But then, it all goes wrong. The heart of New Testament theology, invented after Jesus' death, is St. Paul's nasty sadomasochistic doctrine of atonement for original sin. The idea is that God had himself incarnated as a man, Jesus, in order that he should be hideously tortured and executed to redeem all our sins. Not just the original sin of Adam and Eve, future sins as well, whether we decide to commit them or not. If God wanted to forgive our sins, why not just forgive them? Who is God trying to impress? Presumably himself, since he is judge and jury, as well as execution victim. To cap it all, according to scientific views of prehistory, Adam, the supposed perpetrator of the original sin, never existed in the first place. An awkward fact, which undermines the premise of Paul's whole tortuously nasty theory. Oh, but of course, the story of Adam and Eve was only ever symbolic, wasn't it? Symbolic? So Jesus had himself tortured and executed for a symbolic sin by a non-existent individual. Nobody, not brought up in the faith, could reach any verdict other than barking mad. The strange theology and questionable texts wouldn't matter but for the unfortunate fact that there are people out there who really believe this stuff is the word of God and act on it, challenging progressive values and the rule of law. If you take the good book to its literal extreme, and some people do, you can justify murder. In 1994, the Reverend Paul Hill shot and killed Dr. John Britton outside his abortion clinic in Florida. In 2003, Hill was executed for murder but he went to his death, claiming his actions were backed by Holy Scripture. I'm going to meet Paul Hill's friend and defender, the Reverend Michael Bray. Mr. Bray? Yes, sir. Hello. Hello. 
I'm Richard Dawkins. Good to meet you, sir. Michael Bray. On what moral basis can he, as a Christian, defend a self-professed cold-blooded killer? Your friend, Paul Hill, who was convicted of murdering a doctor, he took the law into his own hands, didn't he? No. Um, Paul Hill, by his own testimony, acted defensively, uh, not uh, in retribution. That's the job of the law. The job, is to, the job of the law is to, is to punish. Yeah. The job of citizens <clears throat> is to, is indeed, out of love, to protect one another. Does it ever occur to you that that doctor had a wife to grieve for him and Paul Hill killed him? Now, the embryos that Paul Hill was defending, they were tiny little things without any knowledge, without any memory, without any fears, without all the things that a full-grown adult doctor had. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that give your conscience a little bit of a twinge? Well, I, I don't think we measure the, the value of someone by their, their, their cognizance of, of their surroundings or, their, or even their relationships. Uh, the value that we give human beings historically and thankfully from the scriptures is that they are created in God's image and they, are, they have a certain sanctity because of that. So whether they be imbeciles or... To most sensible people, Bray's fellow clergyman, Paul Hill, looks like a dangerous psychopath, writing what he perceived as wrong by committing another, more terrible wrong. Yet people like Hill and Bray don't see the world that way. They declare that their justification is in the Bible, and by re-declaring the Bible as the absolute word of God, they give their actions validity. Many of us who, who don't subscribe to any particular holy book mm -hmm. worry about suffering. We actually worry about whether the victim of a murder, whether it's a murder of a, in your, in your terms, of an, of an embryo or of an adult doctor. I mean, can you not see that there's a big imbalance there between, between those, two, those two deaths? Well, I, I couldn't take into account, because I'm not omniscient, to know all the sufferings that, that, that various people suffer uh, Where do you think he is, but, uh, Paul Hill? Uh, oh, I, I have high hopes that he's uh, doing well. You, you think he's in heaven? Yes. You think Jesus approves so. of murdering doctors? Uh, I think that uh, he said that uh, he said that we're to love the children just as we love others. Suffer the little children to come to me. I reckon I have a fairly strong moral conviction as well, but I'm not that confident. I wouldn't like to go and kill somebody mm -hmm. for the sake of my morality. How can you be that confident? I think uh, my own confidence, I guess, has come with, with, with time. The more I, I, I think the scriptures, the, the more I live, the, the, the more satisfied I am intellectually that they interpret reality for me. It was curious. I quite liked him. I thought he was sincere. Uh, I thought he wasn't really an evil person. And I was reminded of a, a quotation by the famous American physicist, Steven Weinberg, Nobel Prize winning theoretical physicist. Weinberg said, religion is an insult to human dignity. Without it, you'd have good people doing good things and evil people doing evil things. But for good people to do evil things, it takes religion. People like Michael Bray are a big problem for Christian morality. Not all Christians are as rooted in the soil of scripture, but they do all take inspiration from the same holy text. But who is right? The established Church of England is being painfully torn apart by these differences of opinion over the scriptures. The battleground is not so much abortion, but homosexuality and gay clergy. On one side are vociferous scriptural purists, on the other more moderate believers who interpret the Bible selectively. You're on the liberal wing of the Anglican Church. Maybe the other side are the ones who are being mm. true to their scriptures in a way that you're not. I mean, you, mm. who are liberal and much closer to what I would, mm. would think, are the one who's departing from the, certainly from the scriptural yeah. and yeah. Um, perhaps from the fundamentals. Um, 
Well, if you take the issue of homosexuality, there's no doubt about it. There are a number of texts, not as many as people think, but a few texts, which clearly regard homosexuality as wrong, both uh, in the Old Testament very strongly, but they're also there in the New Testament. But, of course, it's a question of, of how you interpret the Bible, whether it's really uh, right to, to just simply uh, with, extract a few isolated texts uh, rather than seeing the whole message of the Bible, the whole message of, of Jesus. But I think there's another, perhaps even more fundamental one, which links in uh, to your fundamental interest in evolution. Our understanding of what it is to be a gay or lesbian now is very, very different from what it was, let us say, in the Roman world when the New Testament's written. They thought it was purely a matter of choice. We now actually know that a significant percentage of people are predominantly attracted to members of their own sex. So it's a question of the changing facts as, as well as uh, a changing understanding of how the Bible should be interpreted. This, of course, is all music to my ears, but I, I, I'm kind of left wondering why you stick with Christianity at all, therefore. And maybe some other fundamentalists might, might say just that to you. I think that moderates need to be passionate both about their religious beliefs uh, and about rationality. Uh, and it's possible to be a passionate uh, moderate. It's much more Some say that while religious fundamentalists betray reason, moderate believers betray reason and faith equally. The moderate's position seems to me to be fence-sitting. They half believe in the Bible, but how do they decide which parts to believe literally and which parts are just allegorical? I take it that as an Anglican bishop, you, you wouldn't deny miracles, and I think you ought to, to be consistent with, with what you've just been saying. I think if God was doing miracles the whole time, uh, then we would live in an Alice in Wonderland type yeah. of world. It would be unpredictable, and you and I wouldn't be able to have a rational conversation. Yeah. It's almost though like you think there's a kind of ration of miracles which mustn't be exceeded, but or we get into well, we can't say what territory. we can't say what that ration is. If miracles were happening all the time, whenever whenever we wanted them to happen, then human life as we know it couldn't exist. And what about sort of really big miracles like the virgin birth? What what do you think about that? I don't think that it's on a par with the resurrection, for example. I mean, I actually do believe that the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Uh, is absolutely fundamental to Christianity in a way that I don't believe the virgin birth is. It seems to me an odd proposition that we should adhere to some parts of the Bible story but not to others. After all, when it comes to important moral questions, by what standards do we cherry-pick the Bible? Why bother with the Bible at all if we have the ability to pick and choose from it what is right and what is wrong for today's society? I suspect that religion is simply a parasite on a much older moral sense. I want to examine how science reveals the true roots of human morality. Morality stems not from some fictional deity and his texts, but from altruistic genes that have been naturally selected. Humans have um, much more sophisticated versions of the kinds of social instincts you see in chimps and other creatures. Really, there's no great leap. It's just you can think of chimps as MS-DOS and humans as Windows 2000. Religious believers like to claim that their God and ancient texts provide them with an inside track to defining what is good and what is bad. But it is surely far more moral to do good things for their own sake, rather than as a way of sucking up to God. Our true sense of right and wrong has nothing to do with religion. I believe there is kindness, charity, and generosity in human nature. And I think there is a Darwinian explanation for this. Through much of our prehistory, Humans lived under conditions that favored altruistic genes. Gene survival depended on nurturing our family and on doing deals with our peers. The I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine principle. I don't think we need religion to explain morality, and if anything, it just gets in the way. Morality is a lot older than religion. Uh, humans have an, an innate moral sense or a range of moral senses that you can think of as sophisticated versions of the kind of social instincts you see in uh, chimps and other social species. What sort of 
morality or proto-morality would you expect to find in a chimpanzee troop? We find that they, they live in family groups. The, the mothers look after their, uh, their kids. They work, in, they work in teams. And also, chimps are particularly good um, at competing for status through what's been called public service. So they compete for status not just through brute force, but by being um, good leaders, by uh, intervening to uh, settle disputes. What are the main evolutionary reasons for cooperating and being altruistic? Working together often produces um, mutual benefits that, for those that are involved. So um, you can often just do better by working in a team than you can by working by yourself. Perhaps it is our genetic inheritance that explains why those of us with no allegiance to a holy book or a pope or an ayatollah to tell us what is good still manage to ground ourselves in a moral consensus which is surprisingly widely agreed. As social animals, we worked out that we wouldn't want to live in a society where it was acceptable to rape, murder or steal. We have a moral conscience and a mutual empathy and it is constantly evolving. Religious or not, we have changed in unison and continue to change in our attitude to what is right and what is wrong. Fifty years ago, just about everybody in Britain was somewhat racist. Now, only a few people are. Fifty years ago, it was impossible for gay people to walk along the street hand in hand. Now, it's easy. Some of us lag behind the advancing wave of moral standards, and some of us are ahead. But all of us in the 21st century are ahead of our counterparts from the time of Abraham, Mohammed, or St. Paul. The progressive shift often emerges in opposition to religion. It's driven by improved education and then expressed by newspaper editorials television soap operas, parliamentary speeches, judicial rulings, and novels. I guess my starting point would be the brain is responsible for consciousness. And we could be reasonably sure that when that brain ceases to be, when it falls apart and decomposes, that'll be the end of us. From that, quite a lot of things follow. I think especially morally, we are the very privileged owners of a brief spark of consciousness and we therefore have to take responsibility for it you cannot rely as christians or uh, muslims do on a world elsewhere a paradise to which one can work towards and maybe make sacrifices and crucially make sacrifices of other people we have a marvelous gift and you see it develop in children this ability to become aware that other people have minds just like your own and feelings that are just as important as your own. And this gift of empathy seems to me to be the building block of, of our moral system. I profoundly agree with you, and I've always felt that one of the things that's wrong with religion is that it teaches us to be satisfied with mm. answers which are not really answers at all. And if you have a sacred text that tells you how the world began or what the relationship is between this sky god and you, uh, it does curtail your curiosity. It cuts off a source of wonder. The loveliness of the world in, in, in its wondrousness is not apparent to me in Islam or Christianity and all the other uh, major religions. To an atheist like Ian McEwan, there is no all-seeing, all-loving God who keeps us free from harm. But atheism is not a recipe for despair. I think the opposite. By disclaiming the idea of a next life, we can take more excitement in this one. The here and now is not something to be endured before eternal bliss or damnation. The here and now is all we have, an inspiration to make the most of it. So atheism is life-affirming in a way religion can never be. Look around you. Nature demands our attention, begs us to explore, to question. Religion can provide only facile, ultimately unsatisfying answers. Science, in constantly seeking real explanations, 
reveals the true majesty of our world in all its complexity. People sometimes say, there must be more than just this world, than just this life. But how much more do you want? We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die, because they're never going to be born. The number of people who could be here, in my place, outnumber the sand grains of Sahara. If you think about all the different ways in which our genes could be permuted, you and I are quite grotesquely lucky to be here. The number of events that had to happen in order for you to exist, in order for me to exist. We are privileged to be alive, and we should make the most of our time on this world. Oi pessoal, aqui, peraí, aqui mais rápido. E, e, é o seguinte, é lógico que o, eu não vou falar agora de certo posicionamento dele, porque eu também não vou defender aqui religião coisa religiosa, como por exemplo que, que tem algumas coisas que não é função da ciência que religião vai onde a ciência não consegue ir é, agora religião também como você o Daniel falando assim, o Rabin dizendo que a Terra tem 5 mil anos, também religião não pode se meter em dar explicações sobre a natureza, porque eles não têm condições. A partir de textos sagrados, falar sobre questões da natureza, por tudo que é aquilo, aquilo que a gente já falou, por tudo aquilo que a gente já falou, não há condições epistemológicas para um religioso dogmático falar sobre força da natureza, origem do universo, eles não têm condições para isso. A natureza é muito, mas muito mais grandiosa do que uma explicação mítica de, mil an de milhares de anos atrás, que foi criada milhares de anos, de anos atrás, dentro de um contexto, dentro de um contexto cultural, histórico, social, tribal quase, né? de tribos. Histórias de tribo é uma coisa. De considerar que aquilo, por ser sagrado, é, é explicação para tudo. É, olha, bem também vai ver aqueles exemplos da moral como algo de origem biológica. Nós vamos ver isso. Vamos ver autores que falam disso. Certo? Que falam disso, que... Essa, dessa, algum ponto ali na última parte, esse argumento na última parte do documentário, da segunda parte do documentário, né? teve o vírus, que é o Deus, um delírio, e depois o vírus da fé. E na, no, aquela argumentação que ele colocou ali no final, ele no livro dá no começo. E, de fato, o Caixi. O, o, as ciências naturais têm a limitação do método naturalístico. Então, não, não poderia, talvez, 
verificar a existência, ou corroborar, ou ter evidência da existência de Deus. Mas, porque talvez embarque no, no, nos limites. Mas é mais um exemplo como é mais um exemplo de que ah, existem limitações nas formas de conhecer que têm que ser reconhecidas, certo? Têm que ser reconhecidas. E também, olha, por exemplo, quando se fala que teoria da evolução é só uma teoria, nada mais errado, porque não se entende o que é uma teoria científica? Quem diz isso? Não entende o que é uma teoria científica. Uma teoria científica não é uma, só uma teoria. O, 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 não entende o conceito da, do termo teoria para a ciência. Teoria da relatividade não é só uma teoria. Não, é como se dissesse né, que a teoria da relatividade seria só mais uma explicação sobre como é que é o universo, só mais uma explicação e que seria equivalente a mitos, das mitologias. E, 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 e a gente sabe que não. Vamos descambar. A gente acaba descambando para um relativismo cultural e que quanto mais explicações sobre o universo, melhor. Isso é um relativismo cultural. Olha, que gente da área de sociais, de antropologia, de sociologia, tem um discurso, às vezes que a gente pode chegar a essa conclusão que, ah, então, quanto mais explicações, melhor, é dá mais riqueza cultural. E, e, por isso, essas mitologias têm, a, têm o mesmo status cultural de uma explicação da, da astrofísica. Não é a mesma coisa mesmo séculos de investigação experimental sobre a natureza, não vou dizer séculos de ciência, não, mas séculos de investigação experimental validada pela natureza, investigação da natureza é uma coisa. Uma criação puramente cultural é outra. Não... não. É, é. Vamos, pessoal. Eu... Tá, falta pouco tempo para meio-dia. Falta pouco para meio-dia, meio -dia, né? Porque vocês, talvez, o, o, Os Inimigos da Fé é um documentário que talvez seja mais criticável. Onde a gente pode criticar Richard Dawkins? Ou, em quê? É lógico que ele está criticando as grandes religiões ocidentais, no Oriente Médio, que surgiram ali no Oriente Médio. Judaísmo, cristianismo e islamismo. Ele não está criticando tanto a fé. A questão da fé não é tão dicotômica assim, fé versus razão. A coisa não é tão dicotômica, não é tão certinha. É, a coisa não é tão certinha desse jeito. E por isso que eu falei para vocês, existem cientistas que têm religião e que defendem seu ponto de vista. O Robert Shell Drake e o Francis Collins. Mas é lógico que eles não vão contra a ciência. Certo? Eles não dizem que a Terra tem pouco mais de 5 mil anos de idade. Eles não usam 
Olha, essa discussão atual, só para concluir, certo? discussão entre criacionismo e, e teoria da evolução, que como está colocada por aí, que, aliás, é uma discussão que eu já vi e concordo, o Charbel Ninho Elhani, o nome dele, ele é brasileiro, tem um sobrenome estranho, um nome e um sobrenome estrangeiro, mas é, ele é brasileiro, professor da Federal da Bahia. Agora ele nasceu, não me lembro agora onde. Mas é, ele falando, essa discussão numa uma palestra, ele tem que concordar com ele, muito estúpida. Estúpida, estúpida no nível muito baixo, nível intelectual baixíssimo. A argumentação dos criacionistas que tem, ele tem que colocar por aí é uma argumentação baixíssima, de nível intelectual baixíssimo, muito uma argumentação muito estúpida, né, no sentido de estupidez aí, da, da burrice mesmo, ignorância. E, né, não tem o que defender ali. O orientador de doutorado dele, que é Nélio Bison, lá da USP, é, num artigo, ele, faz, ele, ele fala desse debate, mas o, que o grande problema desse debate, desse pseudo-debate entre o criacionismo, que quer se colocar como uma outra teoria alternativa, quanto o criacionismo não é ciência, é religião. E colocar lá no, como religião acabou. E que não deve ser, o criacionismo não deve ser colocado como uma explicação sobre a natureza. Porque não é estudo da natureza. O estudo da natureza tem que ser com base em metodologia naturalística, que é o que a ciência faz. Certo? Aquilo é religião, se eles acreditam, é questão deles e pronto. Mas é porque esse debate, segundo o Nélio Bison, tem dois extremos, esse pseudo-debate, que não vai chegar a lugar nenhum, não vai chegar a nenhuma conclusão. Por quê? É, não é criacionismo na realidade, é literalismo bíblico. O que estão chamando de criacionismo é o literalismo bíblico. Porque o criacionismo diz que é a crença na criação divina da vida. O criacionismo pode ser compatível com a teoria da evolução. É só questão da origem da vida numa criação que tenha, por exemplo, seja a origem seja... Não é nem o design inteligente, não tem tempo de falar disso, mas eu estou resumindo, resumindo por cada hora. Esse debate, como os evangélicos estão colocando, é entre o literalismo bíblico. A Bíblia é o pé da letra. Como acreditar que, tem, que a Terra tem pouco mais de 5 mil anos? Pegando a Bíblia ao pé da letra e dizer que aquilo é a palavra de Deus e acabou que não se discute? Em vez de encarar aquilo como metáforas, simbólicas, inspiradas e compatíveis com a cultura da época que foi escrito aquilo ali, é uma coisa. Então, é entre o literalismo bíblico e o, o darwinismo materialista. Não é nem teoria da evolução mesmo. É entre o materialismo darwinista, ateísta. Então, são posições, você pode notar, que não tem ponto de encontro nenhum, e não, tem, não tem como entrar em consenso, não vai chegar a lugar nenhum. Né? O ateísta materialista, darwinista, não vai encontrar ideia, nenhuma ideia em comum com o literalismo bíblico. Totalmente diferente. Certo? Né? Vamos lá. Vocês estão me sugerindo o Pirula, né? Fale o ontólogo sobre teoria da evolução. Vou até dar uma olhada. Eu, eu sou inscrito no canal dele. Vou lá procurar especificamente. Vou parar aqui a gravação.
interrompendo a gravação de hoje.